That's it from your Likud party. Now think about it. Who is number 13 on the party list of Likud? Or number 12, or number 11, or number 10, or number 9? Or Labor, or any other party? Nobody knows these people. These are people whose names happen to be on the party list, who could not get elected dog catcher, who could not get elected dog catcher, could not draw votes at all if they were running on their own. The only man who draws heavy support personally, not for a party, is Rabbi America Hanna. Another scene. We went, I went during the 10 days I was there to about seven or eight rallies. Now let me tell you about cop rallies. Cop rallies are run on the cheap. They're run on the cheap because we don't have any money to run them first class. Bear this in mind. The proper way to run a rally, any place, is to send out advanced people, make advertisements in the paper, post uh, signs, vote on voting boards, hand out flyers, and begin to create an atmosphere in advance so people know to show up for a rally. You can't afford that. It all costs money. It requires manpower. It requires paid manpower. And that's becoming harder and harder for us to produce. So how does a cop rally work? About two hours before the rally, we send people over with a truck. They build a platform, really nothing more than a scaffold, put up a cop sign, set up a PA system, and somebody gets up and begins to address the crowd in hopes of attracting attention. Along comes Rabbi Kahani, and then the crowd begins to develop. 200 people, 300 people, 400 people. 500 people. This is with no advance notice. Now, I just lost myself in the crowd and listened to what people were saying and watched who came to these rallies. I watched the reaction of the people. And here's my report to you, my state of the organization, as it were. 80% of the people who attend these rallies are young people, many of them soldiers in uniform. They love Mayor Kahani. They applaud, they cheer. They, they cheer him on. I mention this for this reason. The truth of the matter really is that after 20 years following in Israel, a revolution has taken place. And the major parties know it. The reason for the disenfranchising of the cop voters wasn't because of the platform of Koch. It was because everybody in Israel knows that Rabbi Meir Kahani single-handedly has performed a miracle and has transformed Israeli youth into supporters of his, of his platforms. Everybody knows that the youth in the army are all pro-Kahani, 80%. There have been polls taken in places like northern Tel Aviv, really a secular, hardly a religious bastion. 46% of the kids in favor of Rabbi Kahani in some polls, 60% in others. Clearly all the polls were calling for, read the, for the Koch party to receive anywhere from eight to 12 seats, which is why the rabbi was dis, well, why the party was uh, disenfranchised. I took a walk with Rabbi Kahani through the Carmel Market in Tel Aviv, a mob scene in terms of the support that he gets. Now, for you to have the other side of the coin, let me mention what's going on here on the legal front. For 20 years, the leader of Koch has been persecuted by Jews on both sides of the ocean. He was persecuted by the Jewish community in this country, and that's a terrible indictment, but it's true, and he's been persecuted by the Israeli establishment when I learned that I could not control him there. It's sad for me, as his student, as his friend, to watch what's going on today. It's sad for me to watch him separated from his family. The rabbi Eno is under, is under indictment and is going to stand trial for sedition in Israel. We just came from Washington where he's fighting for his citizenship in the United States. And I ask myself, what are we being asked to do? This man, risks his American citizenship. This man sits in jail month after month for, for Soviet Jews, for, for Jewish causes. 
This man is separated from his family. This man is constantly separated from his grandchildren. This man is constantly on the road trying to save the Jewish people. And all we're being asked to do is to give him the wherewithal to do it. There's going to be an appeal a little later this evening. Uh, when I, uh, by that time, I may be on a plane back to Washington, which is where I came from this morning. I don't think I'm going to be here to, to see what you do. I will get a call hopefully in the morning. I'm hoping that it'll tell me that Los Angeles has delivered in the style to which it is able to do. And, and I hope that the giving that occurs here later this evening is some, not something that you're comfortable with. I hope it's something that you're uncomfortable with. I hope it's something that pains you. I hope it's something that, that hurts you to give. We need the wherewithal now to get ready for the big push that's going to take place hopefully later this year. If we get the money from you, Koch is going to become the third largest party at the very least in the Knesset. If we don't get it, we will have no one to blame but ourselves for the result that may occur. Now, at this time, it is my pleasure, without any, any need of a fancy introduction, to introduce your friend and mine, your teacher and mine, a prophet in our times for the Jewish people, Rabbi Meir Kahani. years now since I became active in Jewish activism. And many people sitting in this room really go back almost that far with me. And I think that the pity is that as the years go by, we forget, especially the young people who weren't born then or who were very young then, Forget how things were. And the things that we did, both through JDL and through Kach. We forget how it was in 1968. We forget how young Jews at that time in this country were fighting for every other cause except the Jewish cause. We forget that in those days on, on campuses, young Jews were fighting for Vietnam, and for Castro, and for civil rights, and for lettuce, and for grapes. And no one was fighting for Jews. We forget that back, not only back in the East, in New York City, and in Boston, and in Philadelphia, but in this city, Fairfax, Elderly Jews, poverty-stricken Jews, were subject to crime and mugging and discrimination. That the merit system was under attack. And the Jewish Defense League came in, into being. And it said what at that time was a radical statement. That for Jews, Jewish problems come first. And that which is the bottom line for Jews in, in every single issue is simply, is it good for the Jews? And when we came out and said that, things which today are, are accepted axioms, the attacks upon us were incredible. That's too parochial. If black said that black is beautiful, that was OK. If black said that black problems come first, that was okay. But if Jews said it, it wasn't okay. And we said it. And for the first time, Jews organized patrols that went into neighborhoods in which poor Jews lived. Neighborhoods from which the wealthier Jews had fled and the younger Jews had fled, leaving behind old people and poor people. And when we came in there with patrols to protect them and to fight back and to teach hoodlums that 
Jews can be as tough and as bad as anyone else. The outcry that emerged from the Jewish establishment, from the same Jews who had fled those areas to the suburbs and left these poor and these elderly people behind, vigilantes, they were, they were sitting comfortably in the valley and on the island. I'm talking about the vigilantes. We made Jewish power a real thing and an important thing. And we said that for too long Jews have been nice. So nice that they stepped on us and cramped on us with contempt. <coughs> Jews were always good, and that was bad. I remember back east, there was a city called Newark, New Jersey. Once upon a time, it had a population of some 30,000 30, Jews. Today, there are no Jews in Newark. Once upon a time in Newark's North, North End, there was an Italian community. There still is. You know what the difference is? The Jews were good, and that was bad. The Italians were bad, and that was good. <laughs> what happened was that the JDL eventually affected the entire community. And suddenly, other Jews started saying, it's not so bad, and we have to fight back, and we have to have Jewish pride, and Jewish problems must come first. And that was the victory of JDL. And today, as Soviet Jews are pouring out of the, out of the country into Israel, and I remember seeing a big ad by the Federation, we did it. We did it. Of course we did it. Of course they were the ones that did it. They were the ones that always fought for Russian Jews from 1920 and 19. Of course, certainly. It was the JDL which went out and felt the pain of other Jews and went out and did for Jews what, other, what every other normal people does for its people. The JDL went out and used violence. And every Jewish liberal went crazy violence. Of course, if they throw a bomb in South Africa, if the ANC throws a bomb, that's a freedom bomb. Of course, sir. Of course, sir. Right? El Salvador, that's a freedom bomb. But when Jews use bombs for their people who for 50 years have been trapped behind that, that iron curtain and no one cared for them, neither Gentiles nor Jews, then suddenly that was a terrible thing. I remember the first action that we took against the Soviets, three simultaneous actions. One of them was at the TASS news agency in Rockefeller Center in New York City. We took over the office, came in, locked, locked the doors, smashed their equipment and beat up the Russians, locked the doors and called the police and said, this is the JDL coming, we've just smashed, smashed the office. And the police came in television of my because first it was incredible enough that someone took over a Russian office in 1968. Jews? And the police came and television was there and I remember being handcuffed to a sergeant and there was a New York TV man named Gay, Gay Pressman was probably still around. And Preston said to me, Rabbi, aren't you a, a flea going up against an elephant? And I started to answer him, and, the, and they took me away. Two years later, when the first 50,000 Russian Jews, the first ones, had gotten out, at a press conference, Gabe Preston showed up, and I never forgot the question. And I said to him, Mr. Preston, let me answer the question. 
The elephant is not that big and the flea is not that small. And I remember when the JDL bombed the Amtorg office, the trade office of the Soviets. And the next day, Charles Yost, the US ambassador to the UN, called me up. And he didn't usually call me up since we went to different schools. <laughs> And he said, Rabbi, I must see you immediately. Please come down to my office. And I went down to the US mission to the UN on First Avenue in New York City. And he met me there in the lobby. He took me into his office. And he said, Rabbi, you're hurting American foreign policy. And I said, Mr. Yost, you don't understand. That's exactly what I'm trying to do. And if the Soviets want a detente with you, then they've got to pay in Jews. And that was the year when, for the first time in history, 15,000 Soviet Jews got out. It was a miracle. It was a miracle. And then 35,000, then 50,000. And that was done because young Jews were ready to make the sacrifices and go to jail and use violence because violence is a terrible thing and sometimes a terribly necessary thing. There's a time for war and a time for peace, the Bible tells us. It's time for war and a time for peace. The Soviet Jews got out not because of the Federation. The Soviet Jews got out because young Jews went out into the streets and did that which nice Jews are not supposed to do, and that is to use violence against people who were destroying our people. That is why today we have the culmination of what was begun back in 1968. And transfer. Today in Israel, everybody's talking transfer. But I remember when I first got up in the University of Haifa in 1972, and I gave a speech and I said, we cannot coexist with, with the Arabs. They are a danger to us. They must go. And the wall-to-wall -wall criticism from the left to the right, the following Sunday there was a, at a cabinet meeting, a resolution was drafted by the cabinet that Kahana does not speak for the Israeli government. I never twice spoke for the Israeli government. I just said that the Arabs must go and the condemnations, and the arrests, and the arrests, and the harassment, and, and so on. But today, everybody speaks of transfer. Everybody. And that was also because there was a willingness to sacrifice and to give of ourselves. And so more than 20 years have, have passed. 20 very, very difficult years. I've been in the country now for less than a week. And uh, it's hard for me to try to describe to you what the situation really is in Israel. Because no matter how much you think that you know it, you don't know it. You have to live there to see the f fulfillment, tragically, of a pasuk, a verse, in the admonition, the tochacha, in the Torah. Yacha Hashem b'shigon, u'v'ivaron, u'v'timon levav. And the Lord shall smite thee with madness and with blindness and with astonishment of heart. I look around Israel and I'm, and I'm convinced. I am in an insane asylum. She go on madness. I'm convinced I'm in the house of the blind, Ivaron. And astonishment of heart, I cannot believe that a people that was an Am Chacham Vinavon, a wise and understanding people, turns into an Am Naval Veloch Chacham, a foolish people and unwise. Two weeks ago, a Jew killed seven Arabs. Now, the weeping and wailing that went on in Israel 
I thought that it was uh, Tisha B'Av. I have not heard such weeping and, and wailing when Jews were there. Bitzalel is the art school in Jerusalem. Twenty arts, art students from Bitzalel went to the place and put up a wooden monument to the seven Arabs. Not once did they ever go to the site of a murder of 16 Jews for the, at the bus 405 or any other bus and put up a, a monument, a wooden monument. So right, the next night we came and burned it, but that's not the point. <laughs> that's not the point. When seven Jews were murdered at Rasburka in the Sinai, did the Egyptians get up and weep and wail? They made a hero out of the soldier who shot them. A hero. Two schools are named after him today in Egypt. When an Arab seized the wheel, a bus 405, and drove it over the cliff, and 16 Jews died. Did anybody weep and wail? In the Arab world, there was a tzahala, the simcha, there was joy and rejoicing. So I, I'm not saying that Jews should go and shoot on Arabs. But if someone does it, say it. <laughs> why the weeping, why the wailing? These are seven of our enemies. An hour before the Arabs seized that wheel, who was the Arab? A worker. An hour before he sees that wheel, he would have been called a worker, an innocent Arab. An hour before every Arab murders a Jew, he was an innocent Arab. What would those seven Arabs have done had they lived? I can tell you, Hidvar Torah, on point. In the last of the ten plagues, the slaying of the firstborn, so the Torah tells us that the Almighty slew every first firstborn. Mibchor Paro Hashel Yashav al Kiso, from Pharaoh's firstborn who sat on his throne, Ad Bechor Hashem, until and even unto the firstborn of the prisoners in the dungeons. And the rabbis ask, Mechatu Hashvui. What did the prisoners sin? And after all, why do you blame them? They're prisoners. They didn't do anything. And they answer, because al on every decree that Pharaoh passed against, against the uh, Jews, Hayusmechim, they were happy. You're happy, you're part of the people that's that's happy, you're part of that general people. You think that those seven, seven Arabs weren't happy every time that some Jew died, was murdered? Of course they rejoiced. So what are we weeping about? What, what are we weeping for? <clears throat> the next day, the Arabs of Israel erupted. That's what you had the next day. These masked Arabs, burning and looting and stoning, this isn't Shechem, this is not the West Bank, the East Bank, or the North Bank. This is Israel, this is in Nazareth, in Nazareth. And the headline, the headline, Shash Kaveh, great fears for a disruption of the, of the ties and relations between, with the Arabs of Israel. What relations with the Arabs of Israel? As if until then they loved us. Until then they loved us. Stones, burning tires, fire bombs in Nazareth, Lida, Jaffa, and the Negev. That's what it was. And everybody is shocked. Shocked. Everybody's shocked. It's incredible. Every single week, Jews are shocked. What are you shocked about? That the Arabs of Israel hate Jews? That's what shocks us. 
Of course they hate us. And they always did. From 1920 on, they were murdering Jews. The Intifada started in, in 87. It started in 1920 and has never stopped. And Jews with their infinite need to be loved, an incredible need to be loved. Maybe they'll love us if we treat them nicely. If these people could, if they could, they would bring upon us a Shoah, a Holocaust of hatchets and knives. We talk about <laughs> insanity. One of the Jews decided to bring chocolates to the wounded Arabs. To bring chocolates to the wounded Arabs. The only good thing about it was that the Arabs threw them out. Do you know why? Because they have self-respect. And we don't. And we don't. The wounded refuse to accept gifts. I don't know what is wrong with us. I only know that we are not a normal people. I only know that if you are fighting a war, you don't love your enemy, you hate your enemy. And if you don't hate him, you are going to lose the war. A verse in the Chumash, when you go to war against your enemies, and the rabbis ask, why is it necessary to say against your enemies? Obviously, one doesn't go to war against his friends. And the rabbis say, there's a need to. Do shame oivecha. Know that they are your enemies. Keshem shenam merachamim alechem. Just as they don't have mercy upon you, al terachamu alechem. Don't have mercy upon them. I remember as a child. I remember as a child in World War II. I was a boy of 10. And I remember that in World War II, the American government established an Office of War Information under a uh, journalist named El Elmer Davis. The sole purpose of that office was to make Americans hate Germans and Japanese. That was their purpose. Because if a soldier doesn't believe that that is my enemy, he'll, he will never fight well and never win a war. Eight lehov, eight the snow, the rabbi tells the, the, uh, the uh, Bible tells us. There's a time to love and a time to hate. You love those who love you and you hate those who hate you, or else you will bring down tragedy upon innocent people, as the rabbis say. He who has mercy upon the cruel will someday bring cruelty upon the merciful. What has happened to us? Do you know what they would do to us if they could? Idbach al Yahud. That this is their slogan. Slaughter the Jew. Idbach al Yahud. How many times have I heard that when I was Serving, serving in the army. Idbach al Yahud, slaughter the Jew. And we, eh, we sit over with coffee and cake, work things out with our father with coffee and cake. The Arab does not understand coffee and cake. The Arab understands one thing only, that is strength. Not for nothing is, not for nothing. The, so much of my support comes from, come from Sephardic Jews. They live with Arabs. They know what Arabs are. They didn't sit and, and, and study about Arabs at, at, some, at some seminar led by the hyphenated rabbi at UCLA. <laughs> they know what Arabs are. 
And I know what Arabs are. I never forget when I was in the in the uh, Knesset. One of the Likud uh, members was uh, speaking, and he was speaking about the Arabs and Jews, and he said, why can't the Arabs want to live with us in peace, and then we'll, we'll treat them nicely and treat them equally, and everything. And I, and I, and I was listening to this and nonsense with my mind away. And I suddenly looked, and my eyes met one of the Arab Knesset members. And for three seconds, he looked at me, and I looked at him, and he smiled, and I smiled, because both of us were thinking the same thing. <laughs> this idiot. <laughs> I understand the Arabs, and they understand me, and neither of us can understand Jews. What a tragedy, what a tragedy. No one has a monopoly on peace. Every one of us in Israel wants peace. All of us who have children and grandchildren, we all want peace. Peace now doesn't have a monopoly on peace. But wanting peace and getting peace are two very different things. They don't want peace. The Arabs don't want peace. They want to wipe out Israel. And they have the patience to wait a thousand years. And what has happened to us? We who had the patience to wait for 2,000 years for a state suddenly, after 40 years, suddenly say, but we can't continue this way. Why not? Why not? Why not? What would a Jew in, in Auschwitz have given for the opportunity to have to serve in a Jewish army for a hundred years and live. A state is not given to you on a silver platter. A state is something for which you sacrifice and give of yourself. And if one is not ready to do that, he will not have his state. We have been struck with shigaon, madness, ivaron, blindness, the timon levav, and astonishment of heart. We don't, we don't know. So everyone is upset at, at George Bush. What are you upset at George Bush about? That George Bush says that Jews shouldn't live in the occupied lands. I'm not bothered by George Bush. I'm bothered by Yitzhak Shamir, who doesn't annex the territories and say, now they're not occupied, now they're ours. <laughs> what do you want from some guy in uh, Kansas City? He sees occupied, occupied. I don't want to be an occupier. If it's really occupied, we shouldn't be there. But it's not occupied, it is ours. You are next to territories, you make it part of Israel, just like his Haifa, and then you throw out the Arabs. <laughs> and what will the world say? It will be as angry at Israel as it is today, and at least will have benefited from it. Foolish people. The Almighty pays us, repays us, and punishes us, midah kineged midah, measure for measure. You're afraid of the world? Good. Take them, trust in them, and enjoy them. We're upset that George Bush said that Jews shouldn't live in occupied areas. And then the High Court of Israel declares that Jews shouldn't live in a building in East Jerusalem. What do you want from George Bush? And if you're angry at George Bush, at least be angry for the right reason. He's not 
He doesn't believe that Israel doesn't have sovereignty over East Jerusalem. He doesn't believe that Israel has sovereignty over Jerusalem at all. That's why there are two U.S. consulates in Jerusalem. Israel, America has never recognized Israel's sovereignty over any part of the city. America recognizes the 1947 partition plan, which made that city an international city. So stop worrying about George Bush. George Bush is irrelevant to the Jewish future. If only we would do that which we should do as Jews, with faith in God, if we did that, who cares about George Bush and who is he? But instead, we are afraid of the nations, and so we, we are afraid to put down an intifada, which has gone on now for two and a, two and a half years. It is mind-boggling. Two and a half years. The same army, which in 1967 crushed four Arab armies in six days, can't put down rabble for two and a half years. Unbelief, unbelief. Of course we can put them down if we want to. But there is a policy decision. And the soldiers are not allowed to do this, not allowed to do that, and not this, and not that. And they're frustrated, and their hands are tied, and they're bitter, and they want to leave the country already. Because they see no end to it. If I hear the chief of staff one more time say, if Intifada, it is impossible to put down Intifada, I will go mad. It is impossible. How many times have I said here, let me be the Minister of Defense for a week and there's no Intifada. <laughs> you shut off the territories to the news media. You don't allow a single member of news media into those territories. That's the first. What do we owe Peter Jennings? <laughs> More important, what do we owe Chaim Yavin of Israel TV, who is worse than Peter Jennings by far? No news media. Every morning we will give them a briefing at the King David Hotel on what happened yesterday. <laughs> Those that are not happy will receive free tickets to the Wailing Wall. <laughs> If Margaret Thatcher could keep out the news media in the Falklands, in Grenada, Reagan kept out the news media. I've always been a believer in doing what other people do. So why can't we? Because we have a complex, a complex, what, what will the nation say? They say it anyhow. And then after you keep out the news media, you give a pkuda, an order to the soldiers. Bipkuda hevra. Forty-eight hours. Whatever you, whatever you want to do, do. But after forty-eight hours, I don't want to see an intifada. You will see blessed peace, quiet, based upon fear. Because as long as they were terrified of us, we survived. The moment that they stopped being frightened of us, then Jews began to be afraid to go to Shar Shem and in the Shuk, in Jerusalem, to the Wailing Wall, to the uh, Western Wall, which has now become once again oh, the Wailing Wall. The Arabs understand only strength and only fear, and if that doesn't make people happy, chaval, chaval, it's a pity. Truth is not always a happy thing. The Middle East is a very different world. It, it, it is not North, North Hollywood. A different, different world, different people, different culture, different mindset, different values. <clears throat> it's now been almost two years since the Kach party 
was banned. What was more obscene than the banning was the fact that not one Jewish liberal got up and protested it. That was the obscenity. There is nothing more hypocritical on this earth than a liberal. If Israel had banned an Arab party, can you imagine what would have gone on here? Can, can you imagine what Woody Allen would have been saying? <laughs> Richard Dreyfus would have put out one more trial, another Dreyfus trial. Ma peace now, would, who knows what would have happened? Every Jewish liberal, full page ads every single day in the LA Times, led by Conrad. Who, but here was a Jewish party banned. 200,000 people were disenfranchised and no protest. <clears throat> we were banned because the mafia in Israel, the political mafia, was terrified that we were going to get at least 10 to 12 seats in the 1988 elections. They were terrified because they saw the votes by age groups. And the final poll by age, by age group showed that the 18 to 25 voters, the 18 to 25 year old voters, made Kach the number one party for their age group. And they saw happening, the Likud saw happening to them what they did 20 years earlier to Mapai to to labor. Likud or Herut was a small, insignificant party until a new generation of Sephardic Jews arose, young Jews who voted Begin. They only knew Begin, 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 and they eventually elected Begin. And they saw the same thing happening suddenly, young Jews saying, Kahana, 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 and they saw the same thing happening. But they did to me what even labor did not do to Begin. They banned him. <clears throat> it bothers me that the dinner tonight is one third smaller than the dinner last year and one half as large as the dinner two years ago before I was banned. Because what does that tell me? It tells me that there are people who came up to me two years ago and three years ago and you wonderful, not because I was Americana, but because I was Americana in the Knesset. Manishtana, what makes this Kahana different from all the Kahanas? I'm not the same person that I was then. I say different things now. If I had said different things at the high court, I might have been allowed to run. But then I would have never been there, Kahana. And that I'll never do. So I'm not the same person. There's a famous story about a Rebbe, a Hasidic Rebbe, in, in Europe, when Rebbe's were really Rebbe's, before they would become Rebbe's, they would go out into what they called Golos. They would go out for three years, four years, five years to suffer, wander as poor, as uh, paupers, to, to learn what it means to suffer, so that then when they would become Rebbe's, they would know what poverty is, what suffering is, and they would have mercy. Nice thing which I feel that most, that most rabbis of our time might, might do. This particular Rebbe went out to Golis and he came to a small town on an Erev Shabbat on a Friday. He came to the home of 
a rich Jew, the rich Jew in the, uh, in the town knocked on the door, asked if he could stay, if he had lodging for, uh, for uh, Shabbat, and the rich Jew looked at this pauper and he threw him out. Well, the years passed and now he was the Rebbe, famous, famous Rebbe. And he came back to the same town, but this time horses, chariot, coach. Oh. The rich man heard that this Rebbe was in town. He ran to the hotel and he said, Rebbe, you, mu you must do me, honor me, be my guest for Shabbos. So the Rebbe he said, I will see. When the man left, the Rebbe told the Shabbos, take the coach and take the horses and bring it to his house. The man looked out the window and saw the coach. Went, oh, the Rebbe's coming. Ran outside, coach, horses, but no Rebbe. Ran back to the hotel. He said, Rebbe, what is it? So he said, I'll tell you. See, I was, I was once at your house, and you threw me out. So I asked myself, what's the difference between me today and then, the horses and the coach? So that's what you really want? Who are you clapping for, me or the Knesset? What makes me different today than I was then? The Knesset, that's a difference? That's not a difference. Better always to have truth which fails than falsehood which appears to succeed. There are issues that we raise in Israel that far, far transcend the Arab issue. Of course, the Arab issue is a tremendous issue. It, it's a frightening issue. It's a burning issue. And where was Gandhi? Where was, where was Gandhi three years ago and five years ago and ten years ago? Was he speaking about transfer? He's a hitchhiker who hitched a ride on car. Last November, during a uh, debate, so he blurted out, uh, one Jew is worth a thousand Arabs. So Yossi Sarid, one of, one of the leftists in the Knesset, got up and, and he said, he said this such and that thing. So he said, it isn't true, I didn't say it. So they caught him on TV saying, so they brought to the Knesset committee on the, the Knesset, they showed it, and he said, I'm sorry, it was a mistake. You want to know the difference between me and Gandhi? <laughs> Would I have said, I'm sorry? <laughs> Would I have said one, one Jew is worth 1,000 one, 1, Arabs? Of course not. There are no Arabs, no amount of Arabs in the world that can make up one Jew. When my son was in Lebanon, in the war, he was there in artillery, Totranim. And he came back and told me a story that I already knew, that the Totranim artillery received orders that should a PLO post be located in an Arab village, the artillery was not to give the infantry fire cover. Generally speaking, if the infantry is going to hit a certain post, they first pound the post. They pound it. They first it. And then the infantry goes in. But they were not allowed to because they might kill civilians. And so the infantry had to go in under sniper fire. Do you know how many Jews died because of that criminal order? That's when I said, and I was later arrested, for saying, all the Arabs of Lebanon are not worth the life of one Israeli soldier to me. I apologize for, apologize for that. <coughs> there are many, many issues that, that have to be dealt with, not just Arabs, when I read in the uh, paper that last year, 39 Israeli soldiers committed suicide, 
That's a tragedy. And that is a far, far greater tragedy than Arabs. Because what does that say about the meaningless life of so many youngsters in Israel? A Jewish state which has failed to be Jewish, which has lost its way. You ask any youngster, any secular youngster in Israel for who he is. And he says, I'm Israeli. He's not an Israeli, he's a Jew who lives in Israel. That's an identity. An Israeli, an Arab can also be an Israeli. A Druze can be an Israeli. A Chinaman can be an Israeli. We've lost our way. On the day that Zionism cut away Judaism and thought that it could create a healthy nationalist, that's the day it began to die. The heart of Israel is Judaism and Jewishness. Otherwise, why should this youngster fight and stay in a country if being Jewish doesn't mean anything to him? It's better to marry some volunteer from Holland or from Germany who works on his kibbutz and then move to Holland? As so many do, as so many do. I want Israel not to be a state of Jews. I want Israel to be a Jewish state. I want to see once again a young Jew taking pride in who he is and what he is. And I'm Skula and I'm Nifchal. We are a chosen people. Don't be ashamed of it. My God, be ashamed. I don't want to be chosen. You can't help it, you are. Of course we're chosen. I'd rather go to Harvard than to uh, Brooklyn College. Of course I would. I'd rather be chosen not, than not chosen. That isn't a racist concept. Any non-Jew who wants to become Jewish and be chosen, Vakasha, come on in, the water's fine. <clears throat> on, the, uh, on the plane coming here, half the plane was filled with young Jews leaving. Israelis, Sabos. So everybody's talking about Russian Jews coming to Israel. Nobody talks about 25,000 Israelis who leave every single, single year. That's official. Unofficially, it's higher. I want Jewishness and Judaism and Torah to become an integral part of the school system in Israel. I don't say that youngsters should be forced to keep, to keep the religion, but at least give them freedom of choice let them know what they could have. How many times did I meet in the army youngsters from this kibbutz or that kibbutz? They had never seen a mezuzah, tefillin, never seen a sefer Torah, never seen things that, that the average secular Jewish youngster here sees. This is what we dreamed about, Israel. This, this is what we dreamed of. There are so many other things that have to be changed and that we speak about and others don't. <clears throat> I don't want U.S. economic aid. I'm tired of it. I'm sick of it. Because U.S. economic aid is what makes Israel say, but we can't do this, we can't do that, because otherwise we're going to lose economic aid. Economic aid has turned Israel into a vassal, a vassal state of America. We become an economic junkie, gets his annual shot every single year. What Israel needs, Israel has become a shul. It isn't a state, it's a shul. It runs around a pushka. <laughs> charity from America, charity from UJA, Germany. You don't build a state like a shul. You build a state by building a strong economic infrastructure, free enterprise, a capitalist state. That's what Israel has to be. <clears throat> the bureaucracy has to be into the sea. The bureaucrat, not the Arab, just the bureaucrats. Cut the red tape, 
everything you need, an issuer, a rishayon, a permit, a license, a license to get the permit, a permit to get the license to get the permit. And they can drive you crazy there. In every normal country, they welcome pri private capital. In Singapore, you want to build a factory? Come in, Muhim habayim, they say in whatever language they speak in Singapore. In Taiwan, they welcome you. Hong Kong, a little nothing island, billion. Why? They welcome you. In Israel, you go to the seven circles of Jewish hell. I don't want USA. I want Israel to open its doors wide to business, not charity. You want to invest, come on in, you'll make, you'll make money. And if you give people an opportunity to make money, then they'll invest. Jews have made every country in which they've lived rich, except Israel. <laughs> that must end. I don't want USA, keep your, keep your money, honey, keep it. Lo, lo midu sheikh, but lo Not your honey and not your sting. And then we'll be able to be b'nei, b'nei really free people, really free. We're not free today. Shamir trembles at, at every time that, at, at, uh, every time that uh, Baker gets up and criticizes. That's not the way. We didn't dream of this kind of a stay, and it doesn't have to be this way. The problem is that affect Jews in this country are things that I want to change. Anti-Semitism in this country is far more serious than anyone here knows. Far more serious. For years we've had in our platform that the state of Israel has an obligation as the Jewish state not only to take money from Jews, but also to help Jews who live outside of the country. Why in the world should Israel be ready to send the Mossad into France, into Greece, into Cyprus, and kill some member of the PLO because he has killed a, a Jew from Israel? Israel has an obligation to protect Jews, whether they are Israelis or not. That's why it is called the Jewish state. If there are serious Nazis who kill or threaten Jews in any country, why should Israel not be obligated to deal with them? Because they are the professionals. In 1977, in Skokie, when the Nazis marched, so Jews went, 2,000 Jews went, 3,000 Jews marched. The police came, the troopers came, the Nazis held their own. If instead of that, if two professionals had been sent by Israel at night to the Nazi building and boom, and then you go away, you, you go home, you don't call up CBS, you go and think I'm out. That's an obligation of Israel. They are the professionals, they know how to do it well. It's not interference in other countries' internal affairs. It's that the country is not prepared, or either will not or cannot, protect Jews, then that becomes our affair. There are so many, many other, other issues that have to be dealt, dealt, dealt with, in which we can deal with. And that is what makes us different from all the other parties. Now, we are going, please God, to run again. People as well knew, but tell us what are you going to do? We're going to run again. Different name, different party. We have to change the name because, because that name has now been officially called racist. Different name, different party. And based upon the law um, under which we were banned, the law under which we were banned states clearly that no statement shall be deemed racist if it is based upon Sifredat books books of faith, of religion, or pulchandat, or a ritual of religion. That anyone who bases his views upon sources of religion shall not be called racist. 
That's what the law says. We're going to have a brand new platform which says only, we base everything we say on religious books and Jewish rituals. Come on, finish. And then we'll be banned anyhow by, by the Knesset committee. That before the high court will come and say, this is what the law says. This is what we, we keep and adhere to. And I will then proceed to read 400 sources in Judaism, which will make Kach look like pussycats. <laughs> we have every reason to believe this time we're not going, going to appear before the high court and talk about Voltaire and Socrates and, and Rousseau and John Locke and, and Tom Paine and so on. We are going to talk about what does the law say exactly, and we follow this law exactly. This time, please God, we will run. This time, we're not talking about five or ten seats. This time, you can bet your mortgage homes it will be anywhere between ten and twenty seats this time. That's what you see. So, and so, I don't know how much longer I'll be able to come back to the States. If I lose my citizenship case, I'll have problems getting back. We don't expect to win in the lower court. My judge is Judge Aubrey Robinson, the one who sentenced Pollard to life. And he was incredibly hostile during the, during, the, uh, during the two days. Whether we win there or don't win there is not so terrible because in the, in the higher courts, we have a much, much better, better chance. In any event, in any event, we need your help. I keep coming back here. And people give. Not a question that people don't, don't give. The question that people don't give enough. I'm talking about the survival of Israel, a country that is falling apart, a country in which Jews are afraid to walk and Jews are afraid to travel, in which cars of Jews are burned every single night, and which an impotent, incompetent government doesn't know what it's doing. And what to save the Jews, not from the Arabs, but from themselves. And for that, we need money. We need help from you. Who is going to give us money? Federation, UJA, they're not going to give us money. We're lucky they don't take money from us. We need help from you. And you're not helping me, you're helping yourselves. You think that if God forbid Israel would not be, you'd be safe here for five minutes? Every roach would come out of the woodwork against the Jews. So give us that support and give us that money so that we can take a country which is smitten with shigon, madness, and yvonne, and blindness, and astonishment of heart, and make it once again the kind of country that is meant to be proud and strong and free, the kind of Jewish state that we dreamed of for 2,000 years. Thank you.